When you think of ancient technological powerhouses, names like Egypt, Greece and Rome often come to mind. But nestled between the Fertile Crescent and the Indus Valley, the ancient Iranian plateau was a centre of ingenuity where civilizations defied the harshest climates, turning arid lands into fertile oases, giving birth to inventions that are still mind-boggling even by today's standards, from sophisticated water management to architectural marvels that can keep food fresh for months and even early forms of air conditioning, all without a single watt of power. This was ancient Iran, historically known as Persia, the dominant nation of Western Asia for over 12 centuries and three times larger than Iran today. A land of powerful empires and vast cultural exchange where diverse peoples coexisted under strong, centralized rule, often tolerant and largely governed by the ancient faith Zoroastrianism that saw the natural world as sacred. It was a society that valued knowledge, trade and architectural innovations. So why did the ancient people of this region develop outstanding technology? And can the echoes of this ancient wisdom offer us any lessons for the future? So coming up, we're going to uncover the remarkable technologies from this region that not only help people to survive, but thrive in the desert. This innovation is the lifeline to living in the desert. It's so essential that this system spread as far to China and Spain. Many are still in use today. One of the oldest and largest of these systems is situated in Yazd, Iran. It's said to be 3,000 years old, stretching up to 100 kilometers in length, and incredibly, it's still in use. This invention was so important that for those who constructed them, they would not be taxed because they would be able to move water to places where it's most scarce, transforming lifeless deserts into lush oases, all without pumps, pipes, or water tanks. It's called a kanat, and for those who achieved this engineering feat, they would be gifted land. Think of a kanat as a hidden river, born from the clever observation of groundwater. Engineers would dig a mother well deep into an upland aquifer, often at the base of mountains. From there they would excavate a gently sloping, near horizontal tunnel, sometimes stretching for tens of kilometers, all by hand. Along this main tunnel, vertical shafts are dug at intervals, not only for ventilation and removing excavated earth, but also as access points for maintenance. And all of this effort digging was for a good reason. By keeping water underground, it can easily be channeled and most importantly conserved by reducing evaporation. On top of that, water is also kept cool and clean. Crops like pomegranates, pistachios and saffron, along with various fruits and vegetables, were irrigated by canat water, sustaining food security for millennia. However, using aquifer water did not mean there was an unlimited supply. Kanat shareholders knew this, so they came up with another interesting invention to help conserve water. This was the water clock, a crucial tool for managing water distribution among the Kanat shareholders and determining religious observances. For Kanats to keep functioning, they need to be maintained. So. Some have gone into disrepair over the years, though many are still in use. A report was published revealing that in Iran there are 30,000 kanats, of which 20,000 are actively still being used. This invention is found in many parts of the world, including Europe and Egypt, though ancient Iran is considered one of the places where some of the oldest originate, possibly 4,000 years ago. These grand, multi-story, intricately designed adobe towers are the most well-preserved examples around the city of Isfahan. These date back to the golden age of this design, around 500 years ago. Unlike simpler, earlier versions, these structures are imposing. Despite their elaborate features, they were not made to house people. Instead, they are used to create a substance that can turn barren deserts into fertile farmlands. Isfahan is known for the cultivation of 
melons, cucumbers, and watermelons. However, these crops deplete the soil of nutrients, which is difficult to regenerate in the desert due to a lack of organic matter. So these towers are often situated close to agricultural fields because they are a gold mine for producing a locally sourced natural fertilizer. It's so effective that these towers are still being used today and it's all down to its clever design. Inside, there are nesting cells designed with an inward slant, allowing for pigeon droppings called guano to fall into a central pit at the base of the tower, making collection easy. Guano is highly prized as a rich, nitrogen-dense natural fertilizer, and with these towers, you can collect a lot of it practically for free. These towers are designed to hold an astonishing number of pigeons, often thousands, sometimes up to 14,000 to 20,000 birds in a single tower. The best part is the pigeons arrive at the towers by their own accord, since it's a safe, cool environment for them. The design ensures protection from predators and proper ventilation, keeping the interior fresh despite the large number of birds. Although some pigeon towers have fallen into disuse with the rise of synthetic fertilizers in the last decades, there has actually been a recent revival to restore and build new pigeon towers because guano has proven to be superior and more cost-effective than the synthetic options. Now let's take a look at this ancient invention that without it, some of our most tasty treats that we love today may have never existed because it's right here in the desert where some of the coolest desserts were originally developed. It's said that this invention may have been created 2,400 years ago, although there isn't really any physical evidence of these unusual structures from that far back due to the adobe material with which they are built being perishable. However, there is written documentation of their existence from medieval Islamic texts and European travellers' accounts that often describe them, sometimes hinting at their long history and widespread use. The most preserved examples date back 500 years ago, and they're situated in the city of Yazd and Kerman. They are particularly robust and have endured centuries due to using a highly durable and water-resistant mortar. This mortar was crucial for structures exposed to water or needing excellent insulation, which took days of work and several complex processes, a highly intensive endeavor, all for an invention that was a symbol of luxury and status. This is a Yakshul, a Persian ice machine, and with a reliable supply of ice from Yakshuls, the Persians began creating refreshing desserts. Due to the effort and resources required to collect and store ice, these early frozen desserts were a luxury enjoyed by royalty and the elite. Feasts and banquets in the Archimedes court would often feature these refreshing and exotic sweets, showcasing wealth and sophistication. During this period, the Persians are credited with inventing falude. This distinctive frozen dessert consists of thin, vermicelli-like noodles, frozen in a syrup, typically flavoured with rose water and sometimes lime juice. The Persian ice maker and freezer works a little differently to our modern versions and it all happens inside these spectacular dome-shaped buildings which are placed near canats. These freeze in the winter and then the ice from the canat is extracted and taken inside the dome. It's carried down into an interior pit that goes 10 meters deep. As more ice is stored in the pit, condensation increases and it can even produce more ice. But there's another crucial element to this desert freezer that we're about to discover next. An interesting discovery was made during excavations at Tepe Chakmak, which dates this crucial invention much farther back than anyone could have imagined. Archaeological investigations conducted by a researcher named Masuda in the 1970s near the city of Sharud in northeastern Iran unearthed a site which is thought to be a fire temple for its many chimney-like structures. Zoroastrian fire temples are a useful invention in itself given the fact that starting a fire in ancient times was not as easy as a click of a switch. So fires in these temples are continuous and they're never left to burn out for practical and symbolic reasons. But actually, it's a discovery of a different invention that surprised archaeologists because the most 
fascinating part of the excavation was that some of the chimney-like structures within the temple showed no traces of ash, which would be typically present if they were used for fires or ovens. This was perplexing for the archaeologists at first because all chimneys at fire temples would be used. This is because fire temples would normally have multiple fires burning, since fires were classed in grades and used for different rituals and purposes, the highest grade being the most sacred, and for this it would take 14,000 hours of ritual. This might seem quite extreme and impractical nowadays, but fire was and still is the cornerstone to civilization. It's the very first building block inside this highly informative encyclopedia. It's the ultimate guide to rebuilding civilizations with over 400 pages of ancient knowledge and wisdom, all printed on quality art matte paper. Here it teaches you how to make the very tool that the Zoroastrian priests would have used to transfer fire. The book continues to take you along the path of humanity, from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance, step by step through unique handmade engineering illustrations. This is not just any other history or science book. This guide gives you the instructions on how to start a society from scratch. There are 180 topics, divided over 23 chapters, covering some of the most amazing inventions ever created. From how to extract and use raw materials to mechanics and industry, it's the perfect gift for curious minds and if you want to get your hands on one, you can purchase through the link in the description. But none of these advancements in civilization could have been possible without the humble fire. But just as much as humans need to harness the power of heat, so do we need the opposite. At the Tape Chetmak archaeological site, there was only one conclusion as to why there would be some chimney structures without ash or the markings of fire. The interpretation was that these structures were not for smoke expulsion at all, but rather for air circulation or ventilation. This suggested they were rudimentary early forms of ancient air conditioning designed to capture and direct breezes for cooling purposes. The most elaborate, tallest and artistically sophisticated ancient air conditioners that are still standing today are not used for fire temples, but instead for homes, buildings and the ice makers. These examples are located in cities like Yazd, many of them built in the late 18th to early 20th century. Over the centuries, the design of these towers became very complex with many variations that were not just for aesthetic purposes. Circular, quadrangle and hexagon shapes all function to capture cooler air and wind from different directions that's present much higher than the ground level. But there's more to it than that. Inside the towers are vertical partitions that create narrower channels. When wind enters one of these channels and is forced into a confined space, its velocity naturally increases. This lower pressure within the windward channel helps to draw air more efficiently into the building. Conversely, on the leeward side, the external wind passing over the smaller openings created by the partitions can create local low pressure zones effectively sucking air out. In some designs, the incoming air would pass over basins or subterranean water channels known as canats. The evaporation of this water would further cool the air before it entered the living spaces, creating a remarkably comfortable environment even in the scorching desert climates. The discovery that an ancient form of air conditioner dates as far back as 4,000 years, just goes to show how important it's been for humans to control the interior climate. And that's why they used wind towers with the Persian ice makers for ventilation and cooling. Ever since the modern electrical air conditioner invented in 1902, our lives have become much more comfortable and productive, not just at home, but in industries. However, they are energy guzzlers and even increase outdoor temperatures. That's why many architects are now looking to air conditioners of the past for more sustainable solutions for the future.